Okay. So we're going to start with the barcode. Do you want to do English first, Hebrew first? Hebrew first. What's the Lord, the Blessed One? Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Amen. And the verse should be the uh, Shema? Page 15 and 16? And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And have these words which I command you this day to be upon your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, and speak of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you retire, when you arise. And you shall bind them for a sign upon your hand, and let them be frontless between your eyes. And you shall write them on the doorposts of your house and upon your gates. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9. And then the next uh, commandment, this, that was the greatest commandment that Yeshua said. And the second greatest commandment that Yeshua said is similar like it. And that's, Be'ahaka, Aleha, Aloka. And you should love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. Do you want to read the Vushamun? Which page? Page 14? Page 14. That can't be. Somewhere right around here. 13 and 14. Doesn't matter which, like, smell I use or? Uh, whatever, we, whichever one you want. Okay. So this this is uh, the Bisham room, and that means, and the children of Israel shall keep, and that's from Shmot, or Exodus 31, 6 through 17. What uh, with Isaiah sixty six twenty three in so the Pasha Bandit on the people. The name the Shabbat shalom, 
The children of Israel yeah. shall, shall keep, keep the Shabbat, Shabbat so observe, so observing it throughout, it throughout their generations, generations as an everlasting covenant. It is a sign for you and the children of Israel forever. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Now this is Exodus, or not Exodus, this is Isaiah 66, 23. And, and it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another, from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me. So the Lord. So the Lord. Amen. Amen. Right. And uh, would you bless the children? How about blessing the children? Page eight. So if anyone wants to lay hands on the child there <laughs> in a nice way, there she is waiting. Which page is committing? Hey, Shabbat Shalom. Page seven and eight. Oh, am I leaving school? Yep. Oh, okay. Okay. So, she's a girl, so you only have to do that one. So for dogs. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right, so it says, The Simeh Elohim Kisava Rivka Rachel Vamea. May God make you as Sarah, Rivka, Rachel, and Leah. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, any announcements? Anybody have any announcements? I know Tiffany has an announcement. Uh, yep, Tiffany has an announcement. <laughs> do you have an announcement? I think it has to do with the 27. Oh, yes. <laughs> We are meeting at the Park 325 Main Street on Sunday. This is live, so if anybody would like to join, just let me know. Wasn't working at first. Sorry. I know. Okay. We are meeting on January 27th at 325 Main Street. Do you know where this is at? You said back knows very well. Yes, we're going to hand out supplies, so anybody who wants to join, let me know. And uh, we can meet you there. Always need the help, so let me know. Okay, and that's um, by the library. And if people don't want to yeah, volunteer, it's, it's come meet you. The street from the, the library, right on Main Street. Um, they call it the dog park. It's down the street from Hemming Plaza. Okay, great. Yeah, and then the white avalanche. Yeah, GPS at 325 Main Street. And um, you know, we'll be doing. Finally, got somebody to do haircuts. So oh, big right. blessing what? here today, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, happens to be a mobile uh, hairstylist, very nice lady. She reached out to me on Facebook and said that she Probably would come up. and show up on Sunday and do haircuts. And she's going to bring her whole setup, table, chair, like the whole nine yards. Awesome. I don't have to do anything, so. Awesome. Nice. Nice. Um, also, Lena has an announcement. I'm pretty sure something about polo shirts. Yeah. We have polo shirts for our trip to Israel. Um, they will be anywhere from seven to ten dollars, uh, depending on size and color. Now, can we actually? Can we like people who want polo shirts and some who aren't here today? So if we could spread the word, like uh, Stacy's sick, for example, today. Um, yeah, and Denise and stuff when they come in is, I mean, this is the shirt which they're talking about, the Kahila and Elohim, Elohim uh, polo shirt. And if they could place orders like through you, like write down the size and stuff and pay through you and you'll get with the lady. Yeah. Um, that would only be great. Just, yeah, it's Lena's color. friend. And there are yeah, other colors too, color, right? Whatever, you know, whatever color you choose. Um, I think it'd be good if we were all in unison. Mm -hmm. 
Well, what we were talking about is when we go to Israel, maybe when we go to worship at the Messianic congregation in Israel, that maybe we all wear the polo shirt that day. <laughs> That'd be pretty cool. But, you know, we don't have to. It's up to you guys. Um, you'd obviously have to have a polo shirt to do it. Uh, and you know what colors are available? The, I think there was like a maroon and this navy blue. And is that pretty much? Um, there are lighter like blue a green blue? I think there is a lighter yeah. blue. Which I think the light blue would probably look good with the dark. Right. So if you're interested, just let yeah, Lena know, I guess, and what yeah, size. Yeah. And, yeah. yeah. That's why I was asking. Yeah. Okay. And if it, took, if it, I would say give you ten dollars, and then if it winds up less, you give, you know, you yeah. track what people give you and give them the money back, right? If it's less. So. Okay, is that good, everybody? With the... Zach has an announcement. He's getting married. No. I think I did that already. And the way I know her is that we went to the same Protestant church in Okinawa, Japan. Oh, wow. Small world, yes. Yeah, no, I just found out, we're like, well, I was in Texas that she's been in Jacksonville for like a year. Oh, my gosh, small world. And it's funny, she lives like 15 minutes away from me. She lives on the Navy base. However, if I wanted to be a rebel and hop the fence, it would probably take me like 10 minutes. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or like five minutes to run over there. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know, that's, that's how that works. Okay. okay. Anybody else? Anything you want to share? Any great miracles that you wanted to share or something? Just, you know. Guys, I'm going to cut hair on Sunday to the poor and the homeless and something else happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, I guess I'm going to share that miracle. Yeah. So don't get upset, Tiffany, because I didn't. Oh, I see. <laughs> you know what? <laughs> this is not a recording yet, is it? <laughs> you know what? Hang on. Let's talk about that later. Okay. Let's do that. That'll work. Let's talk about that later. It's really pretty cool. Okay. <laughs> But when when God does things for us, right? We need to share that. We need to tell people that. Why? What is that? So others can believe. So others can believe. But what is it that we're doing? Witnessing. 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 We're thanking him. Thanking him. We're praising him. When you tell people about the things he's done. That's giving praise. And why is it important to praise? What does that do? What does that give to God when you glory, praise? Glory, glory. Gives God glory. That's how you give God glory. You talk about what he's done for you. Exactly. And that's what we're here for, right? To give God glory. So we do it through praise. And there you go. When he does some stuff for you, you've got to talk, tell people about it. Right? It shows that you're grateful for one thing. Yeah. It's a witness. Okay, uh, one last announcement, I think. No, it was two. Uh, one last, second to last. This is more of a real announcement. Um, who can tell me what is Tu B'Shevat? Tu B'Shevat. Tu B'Shevat. Mm -hmm. No? Something about Sarah. Oh, there was there was about three trees. Oh, yeah, the new year for the trees. The new year for trees. When is the new year for trees? It's closed. <laughs> yeah, it's closed. No, it's not right now, but it's pretty close. It's uh, the 20th and the 21st, the evening of the 20th going into the 21st of this year. So uh, it's a good, you know, one tradition is to plant trees during that time frame. Um, can't plant a tree. I don't know. Plant something if you don't want to because you hate animal. You know, hate uh, vegetation. You know, it's okay. Whatever. <laughs> I'm just saying. Uh, no, but you know, one of the practices is to plant trees. Sometimes I think last year we put some money together and we uh, and we could still do that. I don't know. I think what we did and maybe we'll do this. Is it okay for me to say this? We'll, we could do the same thing last year. We we if you want to put some money. Uh, towards planting trees, like we live in a townhouse, we can't plant a tree. Put some money towards, as a congregation, if you want to give a, a special part of your offering or something like that, do an offering for planting trees in Israel, 
then go ahead and if you're doing cash, make it the envelope right for trees in Israel at the bottom so we know. And all of that will go and we'll collect it all together because you can get more trees planted if you put, right, you know, uh, more money together. We'll plant more trees. You get a discount, you know, volume. And so we'll do that. We'll, whatever is collected today for planting today and next week, because it's actually the 20th, 21st. So if you want to get in on that, then uh, if it's cash, use an envelope and put that on there. If it's a check, just write in your memo section, trees in Israel, uh, or Tu B'Shavat, and we'll put that money towards getting trees in Israel. That's why we have that little plaque somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for trees we planted in the past. Um, because trees are important. You know, plants are important. That's where we get oxygen from and stuff. We're supposed to be guardians of the earth. What's the very first commandment that God gave to mankind? I know. What am I talking about, right? So, <laughs> keep. When it says keep the earth, you know, to to guard it and to keep. What is the word like from comes from Shomer? Yes, guard, keep, protect the earth. That's what we're supposed to be doing, not uh, exploiting the earth and using it for whatever we want and polluting it and stuff. You know, uh, so keeping that in mind, you know, why is why is to Bishiva? Why does it exist though? I mean, what's it about? It's called a New Year for trees. Right, we have like so many. We have four New Year's Jewish people. So what's this one about? Why? What is the New Year for trees? Just because we like trees? Is that the only reason? Why is this the New Year for trees? Anybody know? The olive tree. Isn't there in the Bible the olive tree and you branch it in? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. There is a traditional understanding that this is the day that God made plantation. Yeah. Okay. In the Torah, so you get closer. <laughs> right? Close. So we came into the land. Into. When we, when we first came, when Israel first came, we came out of Egypt and we came into the land, right? There were certain commandments dealing with trees. You couldn't eat from the tree for a certain number of years. Well, how do we. what? You know, we had to have a date designated from this date, one year, two years, and you couldn't eat until this certain year. Well, this is the year, like for when you plant a new tree, whatever it is during the year, this is considered the first day, so that three years from this date is when you can start eating from that tree. So it's the new year for trees. Make sense? Kind of, because you have to have a standard date for everybody. You know, you, nobody's like going around keeping the birthdays of all their trees or something. So it's all... It's all from today. Oh, well, not today. The twenty, the night of the twentieth, and the day of the twenty-first this year, to Bishavat. Wow. When you said like commandment regarding like trees, I was also think. I think what I first thought of was the commandment to. Oh yeah, yeah. That's all the Ashalim, all the the uh, trees that people use to worship, like Ashtaroth and stuff like that. Oh, that's a whole different one. Yeah, a whole different <laughs> direction. A whole different commandment. Yeah. yeah, we have all kinds of commandments about trees, right? There's don't eat from this. The very first one was don't eat from this tree. <laughs> you can eat. Well, actually, we could eat from all the trees and as well as from the things that grow up in the ground, except for one particular tree. And then uh, when we're sieging, when there's a siege against a city, if we're the ones besieging a city. We were not to cut down trees. It's like trees are not your enemy. Don't cut down the trees. They're good for food and stuff. Oh. Appreciate the trees, right? So God cares about trees. Hmm. Who knew? Anyway, I think. We have the olive tree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and there's the analogy of the olive tree. We're either a natural branch or grafted into the olive tree, right? So last week we talked about one thing. We talked about was uh, Psalm 122:6, right? This commandment to pray for the shalom of Yerushalayim, remember? Right? And we look, what's that word? It's not really pray, right? There's this other word. And so it has to do with, uh, yeah, the majority of the possibilities um, for that had to do with ask for 
right? Basically. But we went through, there was, this, there was a slew of different um, possibilities. Now, when you look in an English dictionary, right? What do you see? You see the word, and then you see a way, a phonetic uh, guide to help you say it properly. And you see what type of word it is, right? Like noun or verb or something. And then you have something that goes into what? It has, there's different numbers there. What are the different numbers there for? Hmm? Definitions. Definitions, right? Plural, definitions. Sometimes there's only one definition. Sometimes there are multiple definitions. This is in English, right? Certain words can mean different things, right? And so if you see that English word in a sentence, and it has multiple meanings, how do you know which meaning it has in that sentence? Context. Context is king. Well, guess what? Context is king in interpretation, too. So change hats, put on the Hebrew hat. You're looking in Hebrew, you're looking at a lexicon or a Hebrew English dictionary. Guess what you're going to find under different words? You're going to find different definitions, different meanings, right? Um, so context is going to tell you which Hebrew meaning to use there in which sentence, right? And so although there were a variety of meanings there, and we came down to the one, right, which seemed a little out of place, and Zach brought our attention to is consult, right, which basically normally is like seeking advice, the majority of 99.9 something percent at least, uh, taking counsel. There is this slight little thing where like conferring or exchanging ideas, but majority is going to be that one. But was that even, the, I don't know, because this would be a big debate to have gotten off on a sidetrack last week, but it brings up the issue of when we're interpreting, we've got to, well, there are word choices that need to be made. Even within the language, before you even switch to another language, the concept has to be understood. And the way you understand what's, what is attempting, the message that's being attempted to be conveyed is through context. Yeah. Now, this was an imperative talking to people and telling them uh, to do this thing. Now, it could be, it's possible, right? It's the, the majority of meanings were like ask or plead or even direct. <laughs> Some of them were like, like we could direct God to do something, you know, <laughs> to uh, uh, or demand rather, uh, to do this thing to, for Shalom, for Jerusalem. Why would, first of all, why would he be doing that? Why would he be telling us to do that? Why is he telling us to try, this is like to intercede for, your, for Jerusalem, to intercede for Jerusalem. Why, why bother? Why are the words there? Why does he tell us to do it? Not a trick question. <laughs> The apple of his eye. Yeah, he cares. He cares a lot. It's the apple of his eye. What's the one place in the scripture? We did say this. What's the one place in scripture that he wept over? That could use a generic God, uh, but it was in the form of the Mashiach. Still, what one place did God ever weep over? Jerusalem, right? Jerusalem, yeah. So he cares a lot about Jerusalem. Um, and, he's, and he gives, he promises a blessing in that verse. It's Psalm 122, 6, if, if you're not familiar with it. And he promises a blessing to people who do this, who pray for Yerushalayim. Did you catch the blessing there? If you didn't, go back uh, uh, and check it out. Psalm 122, verse 6. The people who do this get a blessing. I heard some page rustling, so people want to know. And they want to read it. Yeah. And see, Tiffany wants to know. She doesn't have her Bible there, so we better tell her. What's the blessing here? What does the last half of that verse say? Pray for Shalom in Jerusalem. May those who love you prosper. May Shalom be within your ramparts, prosperity in your palaces. And when we, were, when we read like this, may or let, 
in the scripture. We're not talking about a, like in English, we often view those words as a passive. You know what I mean? Like, well, oh, allow that to happen. It would be nice. Kind of a laid back kind of idea. You know what I mean? But that's not what's going on there. This let and this may, there's, there's, they're like an imperative kind of form. It's like, make it happen. It's like the king says, let them be released from the prisons. He's not suggesting it. It's not a passive thing. It's like, make it happen. Let them go. Do you understand? It's the same, same kind of thing is going on here. Of those who pray for the peace, for the shalom of Jerusalem, what is promised? Peace. For them, that they would dwell in tranquility. Is one way to put it when you look at the translation options. Again, you have to look at the word options when you translate that to get there. Um, okay, so that's enough of that. All right. The options, by the way, of what to do for Jerusalem, again, number one. And how do they, when you look at an English, English dictionary, look at the different definitions. Why, when they have the different numbers, is there a reason why number one is number one and number two is number two? Or do they just subjectively throw them out there, however they want? Number one, is, well, I don't know, most important, but most common. Right, the one. This is how it's most often used. So the mo, the number is the same way in foreign language dictionaries or lexicons. Uh, and number one would be the ask, and number two would be the inquire of, consult. So it's pretty high up there. Number three, ask, request, demand, and number four, wish for or desire. Let's just be safe and do all of those things for Jerusalem, right? <laughs> I wish for, I desire, I. Uh, ask, I request, I demand humbly, and uh, right, and I even inquire of and consult, like God, how could we help <laughs> to bring about shalom in Jerusalem? Let's have some feedback there, if possible, right? Maybe planting some trees. I don't know. <laughs> okay. All right. That's about it for that. We were going to have, uh, we were going to talk today about uh, some of the basics for our organization. But, you know, it was for people who are going to join us. So maybe we'll still do it. Um, I don't know. Maybe somebody here that wants to. I know some people that wanted to are not here today. They got, you know, one got sick and I don't know what's going on with another one. So, you know, that actually came up and said, hey, we want to join you very um, adamantly. But they might catch this, and if they don't, we can always use the video, and then maybe there's somebody else there with that. So we'll just go ahead with that anyway. What do you think? And it's always good to have a refresher on some of these. It's like the basic ideas, right? And I sent some of them out uh, to start with this week, like by email. You might have caught some of, some of this stuff. Um, good. That works. So let's go. Let's let's start with our name. I have to get the picture right and everything with the camera. Huh? Did I? Oh yeah. We got to do a Torah service. It's a good thing. It's a good thing Diane is here. We would have passed the whole Torah service. Wow. I was looking at it and I was I just passed right over. Okay, so Torah service first. You'll have to wait for the rest. Uh, uh, uh. Here we go. I, don't know, I must be excited or something. Is that what it is? All right. So if I could get a couple of volunteers. Kathy, you know, her arm's hurting. So somebody else, when we get to the part with the bazot, somebody else for sure, please raise the, you know, the Torah. All right. So 1 Timothy 4.13, it's an important part, so I'm glad Diana brought it up. Uh, 1 Timothy 4.13 tells us, pay attention to the public reading of scriptures, to exhort and to teach. Let's all rise as they take the Torah out of its uh, container there. And you can turn and join us on page 64. And you, Sidereen, 64. 
63 and 64. With Inkamocha. In Kamocha, a Elohim, Adonai, but in Kamasecha, Malchut Hamalchut Ko, Olamin, Umem Shatacha, the full door of Adon, Adonai Melech, Adonai Mala, Adonai Himloch. Lolam I Adonaios no Moite Adonaya Vare and Amorashalo. There is none like you among the gods, O Lord, and there is nothing like your works. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion is throughout all generations. The Lord reigns, the Lord has reigned, the Lord will reign. Forever and ever, the Lord will give strength unto his people. The Lord will bless his people with peace. Amen. As we start the parade, join me with the Vahi. And if you haven't been here before, you know there's a, there's a few customs. Uh, most of you are familiar with. You, you've been through a Torah service before? Okay, so in there is the actual Torah in Hebrew, the way it was written originally. Uh, and so we're showing reverence for the Word of God. And if you want, you can actually follow it with your feet, like follow Zach around while he's carrying the Torah, like we did in the wilderness when it was in an ark. Or you could just follow with your eyes. It's up to you. Okay, that's one. Two, when it comes around, uh, there's a scripture that tells us that, it's sweet, that the Word of God is sweet to our lips and healing to our bones. Right? Proverbs 16, 24. And so uh, one custom is to actually take your corner of your tzitzit or your siddur, your prayer book or your Bible or something, or even your finger, but then it smudges. So that's last resort, right? And touch it to the breastplate. Point at the breastplate for it. There's the breastplate. So touch it to the breastplate and then touch it to your lips as if you're kissing the word of God because it's what? Sweet to our lips and healing to our bones. So if you need healing or you know someone that needs healing, when this thing's coming around with them in mind, pray to the Lord and reach out. Reach out in faith and touch the breastplate. Amen? And the last custom, this is peculiar to us and to a couple of the congregations that I know of. What is it? Stomp in the foot. Vayafutsu. When you hear Vayafutsu, stomp your foot. And uh, it's in Hebrew, that's and shattered. Right, uh, because uh, or scattered, excuse me. Because uh, when Moses, you'll be reading this soon, in, in the way that we read, three and a half. After the portion we're talking about when the Torah moved, you know, there was something God said, "Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered." Right, when the Torah would move, every time He would say that, every time, and that's what we're reading, and. When your enemies be scattered, get the image in your mind of a Jewish wedding when the groom, you put a glass on the, on the ground, and when the groom is getting there, at the end of the, of, the, of the wedding, what happens? He takes his foot and he stomps on that glass. And what happens to the glass? All these little pieces, they scatter all over the place. And that's what we're saying about God, let your enemies be scattered. Have that image in your mind. There are enemies of God. There are, the enemies of God... I don't know if you know this. If you're on God's side, they're your enemies. They might be coming, and I know some of you might be under attack from some of those enemies. Do you know what I mean? Uh, a lot of them are spiritual enemies, and they may be coming after you. So we want God to move in our midst. We're raising up the Torah, and we're parading behind it. You could get behind, you know what, if you wanted to really move in faith, you could get up and you could follow that Torah around the room like we did in the wilderness. And you could proclaim this part first very strongly. God, let your enemies be, they're at my enemies too. Let them be scattered. Let them be scattered. That's why we stomp our foot. All right? Yeah. That's right, man. Get excited about it. Does not mean we forget about the scripture to love our enemies. Right. It's just this thing. <laughs> just scattered them. Though. Yes. Hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Well, we want them 
to come to Messiah, we love them in that way, so that then, guess what? They're no longer our enemies, right? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Why he been so high, high emotion, Kuma Hadonai, Haya Hutsu Oleha, Haya Musu Masaneha, Nipateha, Ki Mitsio Tese Hora, Ki Mitsio. travel, Moses would say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered, and let them that hate you flee from you. For from Zion will go forth the Torah and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Blessed be he who in his holiness gave the Torah to his people. You can be seated. Ta'amod zakia bat Adonaya la Torah. Ta'amod Miriam bat Mordechai la Hatara. Ta'amod Vora bat Azriel la Brit Achadasha. You join me in bless the blessing for the Torah, page 65 and 66. Baruch Hu Adonai Hamvorach. Baruch Adonai Hamparach Lolam Mare, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam, Asher Bachabanu Mikol Ha'amim, Panatan Manu Et Toratu, Baruch Ata Adonai Notei HaTorah, Amen. Bless the Lord, the Blessed One. Blessed is the Lord, the Blessed One, for all eternity. Blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has chosen us from all peoples and given us his Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Amen. The portion I'm reading today. The portion I'm reading today is from Numbers chapter 9, verse 15. If everybody would please rise for the rise for the reading. Uvyom akem et hamishkan, kisa he'anan et hamishkan, la ohel ha'e dut, uva erev yye al hamishkan, kamar. A H Ad Boker. On the day the tabernacle was put up, the cloud covered the tabernacle, that is, the tent of the testimony, and in the evening, over the tabernacle was what appeared to be fire, which remained until morning. And join me in the closing blessing at the bottom of 65 and 66. Baruch ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech haolam, asher natan manu Torah emet, v'chaye olam natan badocheinu, Baruch ata Adonai, notein ha-Torah, amen. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us a Torah of truth and has planted eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the Torah. Everyone's already standing for the Vizot. Page 67 and 68. 
זאת התורה, אשר שמו שם לפני בני ישראל, על פי אדוני ויעבושה. איכות התורה, that Moses placed before the children of Israel in God's command by Moses' hand. Amen. And you can be seated and join me on page 6970 for the blessing for the Haftara as they address the Torah up there. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam Asher Bachar Bim Tovim Bratzav Adivrehem Hanemari Emen Baruch Atah Adonai Avocher Batorah Umoshe Avdo ובישראל עמו ובנביאי האמת בצדק. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who selected good prophets and was pleased with their words which were spoken truthfully. Blessed are you, O Lord, who chooses the Torah, your servant Moses, your people Israel, and prophets of truth and righteousness. I'll rise for the reading of the scripture. I'll be reading, I'll be reading from Psalm 68, I mean 67 and 8. And Yavar Kenu, Elohim, Vaviru, Oto, O, Apse, Adet. May God continue to bless us so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. Amen. Join me with the closing blessing. Uh, you can be seated. Join me with the closing blessing. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam Zur kol haolamim Tzadik bakol hadorot האל הנאמר, האומר ועושה, המדבר ומחיה, שכל דבריו אמת וצדק, נאמר, אתה הוא אדוני אלוהינו, ונאמנים דבריך, ודבר אחד מדבריך, הכל לא ישוב ריקם, כי אל מלך נאמר, רחמם אתה, ברוך אתה אדוני. האל הנאמן בכל דבר אמן. In English, blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, rock of all eternities, faithful in all generations, the trustworthy God who says and does, who speaks and makes it come to pass, all of whose words are true and righteous. Faithful are you, O Lord our God, and faithful are your words, for not one word of yours is turned back unfulfilled, for you are a faithful and compassionate God and King. Blessed are you, O Lord, the God who is faithful in all his words. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Blessed are you, O Lord of God, King of the universe, who has given us Messiah Yeshua and the commandments of the new covenant. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. All right. The reading of scripture. I'm reading from Luke 6:22. Ashrechem im yisnau etchem ha'an ashim ve'im imadu etchem 
the hey the herfu mina atsu et shimchem kedshem ra memaan ben haadam makar makarioi este atan mis esosin umas oi afortoi kai stan afaru esosin umas kai ane esosin kai ekfalusin ta anama umas os paneran en el ka tu viu tu antropu. Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. The word blessed is makarioi in Greek and means happy. Identification with Yeshua can lead to persecution. However, Yeshua promised that those who are hated, excluded, or reviled and criticized for his sake will be blessed. This is similar to the Beatitudes stated in Matthew 5.11. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Yeshua continued by stating to rejoice and leap for joy when being persecuted, because there is a reward waiting in heaven for those persecuted for his sake. Amen. Baru ata Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, asher na'aman ha'devar ha'emet, l'chaye olam nata betochenu. Baru ata Adonai, notein ha'brit ha'chavasha, Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has given us the word of truth and has planted life everlasting in our midst. Blessed are you, O Lord, giver of the new covenant. Amen. Amen. All right. So oh, you're already risen. Okay, for page 73 and 74, for Eitz Chaim, as we return the Torah to the Ark. It's high in the To those who take hold of it, and those who support it are praiseworthy. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. Bring us back, Lord, to you, and we shall come. Renew our days as of old. Amen. You can be seated. That is from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 17 and 18, and Lamentations chapter 5, verse 21. So let me ask you, have you taken hold of it? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes. So we have to take hold of the scriptures yes. for them to bless us, right? Yes. All right. And uh, do you support it? Yes. <laughs> what does it mean to take hold of it? What does it mean to take hold of it? What does it mean to support it? Tell me. Support it? Yeah. Obey what it says. Uh, what is, uh, what is, what is the import? Because that's, that's what I think when I hear the word support. Or depending on what yeah. 
How though? Think about it, discuss it, talk about it, live it, agree with it, apply it to your life. Defended with that. Ah, say that again. Defended. Show Defended in what way? What? Show me, yeah. yeah. Defended on um, being able to answer everyone when they say, "What's that scripture?" Against, against uh, the Bible season, season answer. answer I guess. <laughs> to keep it from being mis mistranslated, I think, and, and twisted. To, to mean something other than the truth. Or prevent people from getting rid of it? Yeah, people. There have been people who want to get rid of the scripture, people who want to get rid of the Tanakh only, people who want to, to destroy the Torah scrolls and burn them, like in the you know, World War II, a lot of times in the days of the Maccabees. Uh, Romans did it as well. Um, the Romans did it at times. It wasn't quite like the Maccabees, they were doing it everywhere. Um, but to support it, to support it, what's the it we're talking about? Specifically, yeah, the Torah, right? We have to take hold of the Torah in order for it to help us. What does it mean to take hold of it again? To take hold of it. Does that mean we read it? Study it, meditate on it, apply it. Apply it. Live by it. Apply it. I like those words. There you go. Apply it. Live by it. Yeah. It has to be a conscious effort. It yeah. Not yeah. always come naturally. Yes, that's a fact. It's not enough to just know it. You have to live it. It's like emuna, like our faith. It's not enough. <laughs> right? Faith without works. So faith, emuna, the Hebrew idea of faith, isn't, it doesn't mean mental assent. It doesn't mean, yes, I understand that. Or I acknowledge that it's true. You've got to live it out. You've got to live it out. Or it's not, because, you know, it produces things in your life. If it doesn't produce things in your life, if it doesn't produce change, you're not really living it. If you're not really living it, right? What did Yaakov say? I'm not going to say, you know, in your Bible, it might uh, call his book James. But what does he say about faith? Faith without works is dead. It's not. It's not real. It's. It's. It's not alive. Why did he say that? Because real emunah, because real faith produces works in your life. It's not the other way around. Don't get confused. Works don't produce. Well, I guess it could be a, a circle there to some degree. But the faith comes first, and it originally. But you could like build your faith. You know what I mean? Your faith can be stronger because of things you do once you've already got faith. That's that much is true too, right? But it's what's driving the truth. I heard some other, some pastors, right? When I was going through my education, and and uh, you know, they like sometimes I catch on to some of the terminology or the phrases they use. It's what's driving the train, John? And one of the one of the inner city pastors. I like that guy. He was pretty cool. It's like, what's driving the train? He's, you know, because we were talking about it, telling him our idea, and he's like, yeah, yeah, that makes sense. He said, it's about what's driving the train. You know, faith is producing. It's, it's the one that's pulling the load. You know, those other things follow. Yeah, that makes sense. Not perfect analogy, but it makes sense. So what's driving your train? Right? Okay. So, it's a tree of life to those who take hold of it. And those who support it are praised early. And supporting it, defending it, someone said, would be one thing, right? Say there's a conversation in your family or at a, at a ONAG somewhere or um, at, at a Bible study. And people are, are talking about, you know, that old that law stuff. We don't need that anymore, <laughs> right? It's rampant out there, right? It's I, hey, we don't need any of that stuff. Yeshua did away with that. It's fulfilled. That sort of that sort of uh, mentality, those sort of statements, right? Because people don't uh, grasp. They don't know the language very well. They don't know the context very well. They're not getting the full picture of what's being said in these con in these things. They don't even like. Plerao is the Greek for 
that's fulfill, it means filling full, giving it its full meaning, teaching it, being here as an example, living it out, was plerao. Uh, he said it would never be abolished until even when heaven and earth are destroyed, it would still not be abolished. Torah is forever. That's part of the context. Even of the passage we're talking about it being fulfilled. Go ahead. So in uh, Judaism, um, it's kind of common for like for when one called rabbi would have a Talmud, a, a, a disciple, and uh, when they're doing Torah study, if the disciple or Talmud gets something, has like a profound understanding of the Torah, or applies it properly, the rabbi will be like, "Congratulations, you have fulfilled the Torah in the sense that you have." Done it accurately, or you have uh, understood it well. It doesn't, it doesn't mean like, oh, you fulfilled it. All right, now stop doing it. And it's more like, okay, now you've actually got it. Now you get it. You understand it. You taught it right or applied it correctly. Yeah. Now there's a sense in which he uh, he had to live it perfectly. It, it was a and as an example to us, but it was also in order to fulfill the righteous requirements so that he would be a perfect sacrifice and be able to pay the penalty for our sins. But, you know, he didn't just pay the penalty for our sins. He freed us from our sins, meaning you don't need to keep living in those sins. You're not supposed to keep living in those sins. Part of teshuva, the, the concept in Hebrew of repentance, is that you turn from those sins and follow God and follow his ways now. That's what teshuva, that's what repentance is. And we all, and it is a word that uh, is, is not heard as much anymore uh, in the body of Messiah in many places so much these days, uh, in the days of hyper grace. Um, you don't hear much about teshuva, about repentance and what it means. But we know, we need to know, and we need to share that. What is it to follow God? What are we coming back to? What are his ways that we're supposed to be following when we turn from our own ways? For many people, that's very vague. I think, I think they might throw out a statement, but they don't really know exactly what, what it's, where it's coming from, what it means. Well, I think it's also important to know what we're turning from and what we're turning to. Yeah. So we're turning from sin, obviously, but the sad thing is to so many people like have no clue what the definition of sin is. Like if you ask right. a lot of believers, yeah. the sad thing is, if you ask a lot of believers, like what's what's sin? Like well, how do you define yeah. sin? Well, how does the and um, sometimes you'll get vague answers like oh it's something that makes God upset or makes him upset. Right. Or some might even get close and be like oh it's when you go against the scripture. Well, I think it's First John three four. He First John three four. He says to sin, um, whoever <coughs> commits Sin also commits lawlessness, or sin, sin is lawlessness. Yes, yeah, sin is lawlessness. Yeah. Or some, a lot of translations have whoever sins transgresses the law, or sin is transgression of the law. Yeah. The yeah. Um, Those two verses, you know, uh, also, we really people really need to focus a lot more on those in the body said, of Messiah than they do currently. He said that uh, I have not known sin except by the law. Mm -hmm. So the sin, the law points out a sin, and you know that's. But the good news is, you know, whatever the, we don't, God knows that we're not going to follow it perfectly, which is what His sacrifice is. So, like whatever we do, sins, He is. Do sin, have sin. Atones for that. Well, once you accept Messiah, you have the ability, but you still have you, you still have the struggle in your mind. Yeah. Uh, and we all are born with sin, and we've all if we're honest, have sin in our life at some point, right? Um, when we fall after we have Messiah, it's because it's still our own fault. <laughs> you know, we have this, we have all things pertaining to godliness given to us, though. Peter tells, Kepha tells us. Um, so we don't have the excuse anymore. Well, if, oh, you know, I wish I, if I only had more faith, then maybe I could do it. Well, all we have to do, you know, is you know, stir up our faith and it grows. All we have to do, if only I had more of the Spirit, all we have to do is ask for the Spirit and He gives it freely. Do you see what I'm saying? We have all the things we need. The recent resources of the tapers are not taken. 
Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also just bringing up uh, his voice and his will for your life. Because, um, um, a while ago, I didn't know about Celebrate Recovery. So like, I, I go there with my buddy Yako, and that's been a tremendous help to me. Awesome. Um, okay. And, uh, you know, like I never seen anywhere in the Bible, you know, about when you sin, go to celebrate recovery. <laughs> but um, but the Bible does, you know, teach us, you know, we are to obey God's voice. So I think that God used Yahweh and Jacob to help us on the recovery time. Yeah. It's been a tremendous, made a tremendous difference in my life. Okay. Its ways are ways of pleasantness, and all its paths are peace. If everyone followed the Torah, we would have lives of pleasantness and shalom. Awesome. Uh, okay, so here we go. So what is our name? Is it up there? Good. So here we go. I don't think you can see on the live stream. I don't know if there's a way for me to get where you can still see. See that. Let me see. And see me at the same time. Might be a little tight. Okay, that looks like you can see. You don't see much of like my head chopped off, you know, but whatever. It's important. You get some words up there. Those, those are good. Okay, so Kahilat Elohim, that's the name of our congregation, right? What does it mean? Congregation of God. Congregation of God. And some people are saying, oh, my Kathy's here. <laughs> right? Okay, so congregation of God. Kahila is like congregation. Or Ecclesia. Ecclesia is Greek. Yeah, and that's one of the one of the words that's used to translate Kahila. There's Kahila and Edat and those two Hebrew words. There's two different words in the Greek. Uh, Ecclesia and Synagogue. <laughs> and they're actually interchangeable. So, like when you, a lot of, so some people think like the church is like a New Testament thing, but if, I think in the Septuagint, like when it says like assembly or kehila or kahal in Ecclesia, they would use synagogue. the term ecclesia or church, I guess, the German. Ecclesia and synagogue, and they're everywhere. Yeah. yeah. That's why some, uh, some are a little confused that, but that they say so the, so you'll hear ter her terms like the Church of the Old Testament, for example. <laughs> so when you right? said like upon, you know, he's telling Shimon Kepa or Peter that your name's Kepa, and upon this rock I will build my church. He's we'll build my I'll congregation. Build my, okay, love, my assembly. Because so even the interesting thing the is assembly. even the word ecclesia can mean can be referring to a mob. Because the people are in a mob, the assembly. Yeah. So we're getting on tangents here. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Starting to get on tangents here. But yeah, and one, you know, upon this, will I build my kahal or kahila? Um, what is it he's building it on? And that's something that is debated as well. Is it on the notion that he is, that Kepha had just said, that he is the Mashiach, the Son of God? Or is it on him because he's cool? He's. <laughs> Kepha, you know, so should be on it. Anyway, uh, so people have different ideas about that, and you could probably get a clue where I fall just from the way I said that. <laughs> anyway, but moving on. So that's our name, and let's go to the second slide. So this is our vision statement. This is what we decided, you know, as a board, you know, we put this out to everybody, and everybody agreed with it before we put it out when we initially made our uh, became incorporated, made our bylaws and all that stuff. Our vision. This is like this is the goal, you know. This is like where we want to go. It's our vision is to be used by Elohim, a uniplural name for God, uh, to bring reconciliation to the world. I know it's a small goal, <laughs> not very challenging. <laughs> <laughs> to bring reconciliation to the whole world. But it is our part of it, to be used by Elohim in bringing reconciliation to the world. And that's what we try to do, a lot of ways to do that. And that comes later as our, our purpose and things. But you could start thinking about what ways do we bring reconciliation to the world? Right? It's not up there. Are you afraid to I hate from the beginning. 
Still no? Uh, maybe I got to close it and open it again. Give me a second here. I'll get to you. I, I hear you. I oh. just I want to get this, you know. Oh, I got technology. Totally get it. Okay. So that's up there, right? How about now? There we go. Okay, good. The rest should be gold. Our vision is to be used by Elohim to bring reconciliation to the world. Just like big picture, right? Everything is encompassed in this, I think. So what were you saying? Tikkun olam, yeah, world restoration. Yep. Okay, our mission, see that's a lot bigger. Can you see it? Our mission, I'll read it, I don't know how well you can read it. Our mission is to be, is to spread the good news that Yeshua, the King of Israel, has come to provide salvation to all people via his sacrificial death. Everybody good with that so far? And to make Talmudim, disciples from all people groups, teaching them to be a light to the world by obeying the Torah of Elohim. Does that make sense? Is any of that confusing? Is any of that like, ah, oh, that doesn't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I think you guys are screwy. Something's wrong here. I got I to leave. Okay, so uh, we're commanded to do that, right? Make Talmudim of all the Goyim. Make disciples of all the nations. So why not put it in our mission statement? Why do we want to create a new mission when he already gave us one? If this is what we're supposed to be doing, that's our mission. Uh, and teaching them to be a light to the world by obeying the Torah of Elohim. That's actually, he says, to teach them in Matthew 28, teaching the, this, the Goyim that we're making disciples to obey everything that I've taught you. Right? Okay, moving on. Our purpose statement. This is the last of the three statements. I sent it out by email before. Our congregation exists. This is why we exist. To lift Yeshua high. What does that mean, to lift him high? Like find him and pick him up? Where's Yeshua? Pick him up. What does it mean? It's figurative, right? Huh? Praise him. Praise him. Yeah, talk about the things he's done. Lift him up in our minds and, and, and in people's est estimation of him. And their images of him. Um, to provide solid biblical teaching to all who will listen in order to lead them to Yah, the God of the Bible. And it's appropriate to use Yah here. It's part of a breakdown, a piece of <laughs> a shortened form of the name of God to enable them to live holy, righteous lives and to equip them to make a positive difference in this world themselves, working together towards Tikkun Olam. There you go. <laughs> All right. In other words, we don't, uh, you know, our doing what we're supposed to do doesn't mean that the people that we connect with and lead to Yeshua, that they somehow are supposed to do less. They take the baton. It's their turn to run, too, when they get the baton. They, too, are supposed to live righteous, holy lives. They, too, are supposed to work towards tikkun olam, as well as, and it all flows from recognition of Yeshua first as who he is. And depending, our salvation depends on his, uh, his acts. But they pro they're supposed to produce something in our lives. What, are this, what is it supposed to produce? Where are the guidelines for life? And Zachy brought some great scriptures for that, so we're not gonna not gonna talk about it more now because you already did. It. So, moving on, membership things you need to understand, which I kind of talked about already. Terminology for uh, understanding God properly. Emuna. Tell me what's emuna. I already said a little bit, right? Faith. 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 Faith, faithfulness. The word in Hebrew kind of is really the same. It's really the same. Did you know that? It's really the same word. You can't have faith without faithfulness. 
it wouldn't be real, would it? It would. You might say it would be dead. Yeah. It all. It all comes around, doesn't it? It's a faith that produces works. It's a faith that you live out. If uh, you know, I always use that analogy with the brownies, right? If Sherelle bought, brought in a pack of, you know, a big thing of, bar- of brownies and passed them around, and then Tiffany spread a little rumor about them that there was a little bit of fecal matter got into the brownies, would you eat the brownies? Would you eat the brownies? It, it would depend on some things, right? It would depend on your, your faith in Sherelle and your faith in Tiffany. Who do I trust here? Should I eat from the tree? Should I eat the brownie? What will happen to me? Right? Is there stuff in there or not that I should be eating? Okay, so that's emunah. It will impact your life. You will either eat the brownie or you will choose to shun the brownie even though you love brownies. You with me? All right. Teshuva. Talked about it. What's teshuva? Repentance. What does it encompass? Turning from. Turning from. Turning from sin. Turning from our own ways. Like before, if you don't accept God's ways are the right ways, then most people you think your ways are the right ways. You might think some other ways are the right ways, right? There are other holy books out there and whatnot. You might think those are the right way. You might be trying to follow those paths and accept those ideas. But you're accepting those ideas, thus they become your ideas. And so you're following your ways, in a a sense, as well as even though they're somebody else's, somebody else came up with them, you've you've accepted them. So you're following some other ways, you're accepting them as your ways, and you have an epiphany, oh, that's not right. That's not right. You hear the message, you accept that God's ways are the right ways. You accept that mentally, you say, Oh, those are the right ways. But is that all repentance is? Is that all shub is? Is accepting that, hey, these are not the right ways. God's ways are the right ways. Is that all it is? Is it mental ascent? What has to happen? Mental and physical. Mental and physical. Explain. Yeah. Yeah. Not going to follow my ways anymore. So, to do whatever it takes within you to be able to make that turn. Make the turn. You turn around and you go after God and His ways, right? Yeah, you got to make it happen. And it it is a battle, right? Yeah. So maybe you fall down sometimes in the battle. That's a, what do you, what do you, you know, if you're in a, in a war and you're in a battle and you fall down, what should you do? Lay there until you're dead. Somebody comes by and shoot you. What should you do? Get up. Get up, <laughs> Get up and keep fighting. Right. Otherwise you will wind up, you know, dying very easily. So you get up and keep fighting. Yeah. Okay. To shuva. You know, I think that's important. struggle. Like, like we sin. We should, or break the Torah, we shouldn't just like give up. You know, we can keep going at it because, you know, we can't just make our, we can't be perfect, but, you know, as time goes by, we'll get better at it, and then eventually we get a rest of the body, yeah. and then we'll be perfect. Yeah. But, uh, that's the, that's what we call it. sanctification, process of. I think it can kind of tie into the story with the, the bear and the. Bear, yeah. yeah. You remember the story? You like the story of the bear? It's good. It's good analogy. All right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me the story of the oh, bear. You can explain it better. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me. So this, the story of the bear, you know, winter's coming, and bears, the hibernate in the winter, so the bear has to go and collect food and store it away, right? So the bear goes to the, to the nearby field of corn, and this bear likes corn. He's vegetarian, making that up. So he goes to the, <laughs> so he gets his arms full of corn, and he starts headed back to to his cave, you know, with his arms all full. Well, he on the way he drops a little bit of corn, and he tries to stoop, you know, bend over, see if he can pick it back up and get. And more corn starts to fall out, right? When he tries harder to get that one, more starts falling out. 
Oh, he gets frustrated. He, just, he gets angry. When he gets angry, what does he do? He throws all the corn down. He throws all the corn down. Oh, no. Oh, now I have no corn. He's all upset. Right? It's kind of like, like people. We struggle very hard with a particular area in their lives <laughs> that they just can't seem to get right right now. Um, and they don't have enough patience to get through it. And they can't accept that they're not perfect yet. So they get angry. And then they start, other things start to slip in their lives. And then they get even angrier until they just want to throw everything away. When the bear is doing it, it sounds stupid though, doesn't it? <laughs> what does the bear do? The bear goes back to the field and he grabs all the corn he can get in his arms again. He starts heading back to the cave. And what happens? He starts dropping a little bit of corn again. This bear is just not going to make it because he keeps doing the same thing. He's, he keeps getting frustrated and throwing away all the cord. Tell, tell me, what should this bear do? What would be better? Keep what he has. Put that away and then come back for more. Right? <laughs> do you see the analogy for your life? And with the Torah... <laughs> Do what you can, what you can get, do it, do it, and grow. That's a process of sanctification, a process of spiritual growth, working out your salvation. Now, you get your salvation from Yeshua. There's a scripture that says working it out. What it means, it's talking about there is, you know, living it out in your life, growing in it. So, saying that you're saved by works, but after you get saved, it'll produce works. Yeah, you can't save yourself. Yes, you can't save yourself. Because you've already got, we were born with sin. Mm -hmm. Scripture tells us. King David tells us. Yetzer hara. <laughs> Yetzer hara, Yetzer hatov. I think life is all about mastering how to control the Yetzer hara, how to, how to rein it in, you know, and get it into a place of submission to where. It does not control you. And what do those what do those stand for again? Because what the Yetzer Hara? Yetzer Hara, Yetzer Hatov. Evil inclination um, that we're pretty much born with. The sinful nature, I guess, is what most people would call it. It's like that inclination that we naturally have to be selfish and desire evil things, and to go against God. Really, that's all it really is. It's just our desire to do things our own way rather than to lean on Him because it's just our nature, because we're made in his image. So I think sometimes we think we're like our own little mini gods and we can control things and we can do whatever, you know, like we're so divine ourselves and we're really not. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, well, I guess the answer has thought was more yes, like the spirit. Yes. Because so, Shaul says, you know, the flesh is that good inclination. enmity towards God, and it's not subject to his law, Torah. Shaul, Shaul used different terminology from Yitzhar Hara, Yitzhar Hatov. What did he use? I think, um, you touched on it. Flesh and the spirit. Flesh and spirit. Because the Torah, the law, is spiritual. So if you live by your flesh, you're not, you can't please God. But if you're living by the spirit, you're going to be more susceptible to his way. And what does it mean, living by the flesh? Yeah, and then God, or letting the yetzer hara go wild. Yetzer hara go wild. Which, why is flesh a good analogy there? It's not always, well, flesh isn't always bad. Physical cravings. Physically, yeah. We're just pleasing ourselves. Yeah, pleasing ourselves. Our self. needs come first. It's why, you know, so many things in our lives sometimes go wrong. <laughs> or like, when you see marriages fall apart, usually somebody was, you know, maybe going, you know, towards their own, you know, yet to her or their evil inclinations, and then they kind of abandon the spouse, and then things go right. from there. Or bad parents that leave their children because their own desires and their selfishness led them to make those decisions. You have all kinds of different situations where people just, for their own, the person who 
just completely disregards a need that they know someone else has because it's inconvenient. Yes, they are off, you know. So those are the things that I think if we could just learn to keep in check. Sometimes it's addiction. Sometimes it's just your physical need for something comes first from everything from alcohol, drugs, food, people, you know, anything you try to fit, I think, in that space that causes you to want it. So the mantra of our day, like if it feels good, do it. That's not a, that's not scriptural, right? Now we don't go to the opposite extreme. If it feels good, don't do it. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, you have to judge it. You have to weigh it, right? Um, what is the spirit in that analogy? Okay. And what is it practically? What does it mean? It's figurative speech. It's more, it's more or less. The part of yourself that is more inclined to God and following Him, following His Torah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Following His Torah. Obey His voice. And then your soul. To live in your, to live in the spirit. It says the spirit, yeah, the spirit. Okay, yeah, it has no connection to the flesh. Is what I'm trying to say. It's strictly, when you start having eternal perspective on stuff too, like I know from my own life, when we're in the world. Everything we see is tangible and, you know, we fulfill the thirst, the hunger, the desires, lust, whatever it is you have going on, jealousy, all these things you allow. But once you try to walk in the spirit, which, and I say try because at first you, it's hard. <laughs> you really are trying your best because it's hard when, for some people, it's even hard to believe in uh, God because they can't see him touch him and then people in their lives haven't done a good demonstration of God's love so then you throw that on there so once he I, I look at it like a spiritual awakening like we all have the same ability but then one day that switch gets turned on and now he gives you supernatural eyes to see things beyond this realm here like for example someone offends me now before it was like, yeah. <laughs> oh wait, I was was the get the full effect there. But <laughs> <laughs> um, now, when someone does that, God just says, think about where they're coming from. You don't know what that person is going through. It may not even have anything to do with you. They just lashed out at you because you were the one there, or because whatever. So, again, I would never have looked at those things in the natural realm here because I'm thinking me. But once you're living by the spirit, you start, God allows you to see others. Like I heard this cool acronym for joy. It's Jesus, others, and you. And that of order. Jesus first, others, and your last. That should give you joy because what is it more blessed to give than to receive? So, you know, you, it, it just changes the spiritual and the flesh is like, so uh, I might have the wrong scripture, but I saw where, was it Shimon who said it, or Shimon Kent, but it said to count others higher than yourself. Mm -hmm. I think, and to live in the spirit, or let the spirit lead you, I look at it as like the space where Yeshua's spirit lives in me. That space, that mm -hmm. part of my spirit that has connected with his spirit, where he dwells in me, and that's what needs to lead me. That's what should pull the train. You know, that part of me, not the flesh, because we all know that road leaves. Not a good look, but letting Yeshua drive the train is the only way I think to make it through and to actually have control over that yet to her own. Because we, in our own capacity, really, I mean, we, can, we have the tools, but it's Him and His Spirit that really gives us that. that push and that strength to, make, you know, to actually right. overcome, to overcome those desires. I don't think me and my own capacity could ever come to the place where I am now. Like it was a supernatural thing. It's not something that I could ever do. It's just inexplainable. It's a supernatural thing. It's submitting and letting his spirit control and drive that train. Well, you, you said uh, two words together there. His spirit. Now when we come to when we come to Yeshua, he gives us his spirit. So there's another spirit living inside us. Now we can live by the flesh, like uh, well, our desires, or we can live by the spirit. 
Now, the spirit, you know, we could think of our spirit, we could also think of his spirit, which is inside of us. And what does his spirit do? Why is it inside of us? What does it do for us? It supports the law written in our hearts. So he's God is writing his Torah. What part is spirits in there writing his Torah on your heart? Give me a passion to follow his Torah. What else? So yeah, the part of the Brit Khadasha, the new covenant is he gives his spirit, just in case they didn't hear, gives his spirit so that you're able to and cause and he will cause you to live by his Torah. That's part of the of yeah. You got to yield, yeah, <laughs> though. Like you got to yield. That's when the conviction comes in. Because the minute you mess up, you know, like you're just ah, oh, can I just do that? That's the supernatural before, part. You had his spirit. It didn't matter. There was no consciousness. Like now, is there a conflict between the Torah and the spirit? Well, the, the, the result of the law from the Torah is spiritual. Who wrote the Torah? Who said Moses? Moses wrote the Torah, but who gave him the Torah? <laughs> who inspired him to? Elohim, right. And so, and it's by the spirit of Elohim, he's inspired. So the Torah is from the Spirit. How can there be a conflict between the Torah and the Spirit? The Torah is from the Spirit. He inspired the, the Torah. There's no conflict. You see? Okay. John, I came across a scripture this week. I can't recall. I don't know if it was Thessalonians, but it was interesting because it says, you know, for believers, they have the appearance of godliness, but denying its power. And that there is are so, some who, yeah, yeah. If we were to, re and that just made me think, if we were to really live like the spirit of the King of the Universe is in us, like what power that would give us? Mm -hmm. I almost feel it's almost like the brain. We only use part of the brain. Like we only use part of that spirit-filled part of us. I'm glad you said that. Did you see the post on Facebook? I got it from Dr. Brown's site. Did you see? Dr. Brown's site. There's there's this thing we do that engages every part, every area of our brain. Not every single space within every part, but it it invigorates. It uses every part of our brain, though. Singing. Singing. You want to, uh, what are we told to do? Do you love the Va'ahavta, Zach? What are we supposed to do in the Va'ahavta? What, where does it mention the, the brain, the mind? With all your, how can you get all of your brain engaged in worshiping and loving God at the same time? Singing, worship, praise. It's pretty cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, look at the look what happened when those guys prayed in the jail cell, right? Yeah, I've heard that too. <laughs> yeah, there's there's definitely power in praise. Mm -hmm. Okay, so emuna, teshuva, tevila. What's tevila? Immersion. Immersion. Not sprinkling. Let's bring it. Where does this Tevila idea come from? Did it come from John the Baptist? Okay. Seriously, where is this, so where does this 
Tevila, where does it come from? Was it a new invention in the first century? No. No. What does Tevila mean? Tevila, immersion. Immersion. They're immersions for different reasons. Um, before going in to serve in the temple, after certain things happened that made you unclean, you had to be, right, you had to be immersed before you're considered ritually clean. Um, after having a child, for example, if it's a boy, wait this long. If it's a girl, wait this long, this sort of thing. There were a lot of different reasons for immersions. One of the reasons for immersions is coming to faith in the God of Israel. Did you know that? And when you came to faith in the God of Israel, there's a process you would go through. Uh, you would come under a teacher for a period of time, and when you're done with that, when that teacher is satisfied, then you, you know, then you go before a Beit Din. You would go before uh, it, it's like a, a court uh, of people, but it's not really a formal court or something. There's a couple of people. You would meet with a couple of people who are who are uh, already followers of the God of Israel. And they would ask you some questions to see if you really learned the things you're supposed to have learned, right? And if you and if you did, congratulations. You seal the deal now with an immersion. You go under the mikvah, right? <coughs> Doesn't mean that they bury you underneath the mikvah. No, you go under the water in the mikvah. Tevila, immersion. Go all the way under. Now, guess what? This might be interesting to you. Guess what? No one dunks you. No one dunks you. No one grabs your head and dunks you there. You go under yourself. You're supervised. Someone is there. They're in charge of the process, making sure you do it correctly. But you go under yourself. You make sure that you go all the way under. That's the term immersed, immersion. Some of those movies, when they when they do that, they're correct. There's a, there are a couple of versions that are that have done their homework on this. You see Yeshua going under himself. Someone's there supervising the process. Yochanan the immerser, but he does it himself. But guess how many times? Oh, they always do it once in the movie, right? How many times? But then he's already Jewish. This is something somebody coming to faith in the God of Israel from outside. Guess how many times they go under? This isn't a Christian thing. This is a, this is the Jewish to come to the Jewish faith in Judaism. You immerse yourself, but isn't that an interesting connection? You immerse yourself under supervision three times. We identify with him and with his death, and we also identify with, uh, particularly if you're coming from, from not being from not having a Jewish background, you're coming to the faith, right? You're identifying also, guess what? With the people of Israel who were what? Immersed, figuratively speaking, scripture says this, we were all immersed in the Reed Sea. We called that our going under the water, even though we didn't go under the water, did we? Well, we kind of did. I mean, have you seen uh, Prince of Egypt? That was really awesome. I love that. The, that uh, uh, that scene in there where we go in the water, right? Because what's going on? We're walking through the midst of the Reed Sea. What's this water's walled on both sides, right? The water's way up there. Now it's not over top of us, but it's right there. We are, you could say, under it, right? It's it was well, some deep water. <laughs> So, anyway, so Tuvila, and it's, is Tuvila a suggestion? 
No. Is it, and when we say it's a requirement though, how far do we go? Is it required? Like, is that something we do? If we don't, if we haven't done that yet, are we saved? Is it left, right? Can we go that far? No. No. Yes, sir. Very brave, too. So, how, how do we know that? Do we, well, something comes along? Yeshua is our salvation, not. Yeah. Well, he baptizes yeah. the Holy Spirit. He's, yeah, he's the one who offers that salvation, and then the will just be a symbolic show or display or commitment. The physical immersion is a sign of something that's already happened. And a lot, and lot, there's a couple things there. You know, what Yochanan was doing was a, a an immersion of teshuva showing that you have changed. And he demanded that of people. Show proof that you've changed. There's also acknowledging Yeshua, right? And identifying with him in his death and resurrection. Again, still, there are different reasons for immersion. People still go under the mikvah for after they have a child. Those, that still happens. After so many days, you're still supposed to do that. So don't get lost in this one idea and only one thing that you would get immersed for. Does that make sense? Um, could go further. So it's not, but it is a commandment still to do it. But say you died before you had a chance to do it. Do you think you'd be okay? Well, when I say before you had a chance to do it, what do I mean by that? Do you know what I mean? Well, I'm thinking you've accepted Yeshua. But you planned to be baptism and then you got hit by a bus on the way there. You're, you're okay. But you were trying to do it and you couldn't. You're good. You're good. I think that you're locked in once you accept right. it. You see, there's a difference. That you try to do it, but you could. So my friend, I, we all know Abraham, you know, and Abraham, I don't believe, got a big book because it was after when it was instituted, the priesthood was instituted after that, correct? Well, then we don't know a lot about that time period, you know, but. Rebecca had a good yeah, We didn't have that. She is talking huh? about the thief on the cross. Hey? So the thief on the cross. Yes. Uh, yes. Right? He accepted Yeshua. He knew who he was. Right? Remember me. And, and what did he say? It's too late for you, buddy. You can't do it to be love. Out of luck. <laughs> now, today you'll be with me in paradise. Right? Now, some people who go for the sprinkly might say, well, yeah, but then God rained on them, and so that counts. <laughs> but it's an aversion. All right. But it's a requirement. If you haven't done it, you're supposed to do it. What if you're what if you're able to do it and you and you refuse to do it for some weird reason? I don't know. You're scared of water, maybe? I don't know. People refuse to do it. What is that a sign of then? Fear. Faithlessness. Rebellion. When you, when you came to Yeshua, you're supposed to have turned from your own ways and be following his ways. And part of his ways, he's telling you, he's giving you a command to do something, and you're refusing to do it. You're in rebellion. Out of fear. And, right? And you know where fear comes from. Nothing yeah. So one might question, did you really do Teshuvah then? Why do you not want to do this, something he commanded you to do? So then you're kind of treading on dangerous ground, and for what? What reason? I don't know. I mean, if I <laughs> do you see what I'm saying? Why would you want to play with that? I don't understand. Okay. Last one on there, Adonai. What does it mean? Master. Lord, master. Lord, master. Lord. Archaic English, Lord, master. Or literally, yeah. Lords. Yeah, it's actually lords. It's actually a plural form. 
And we were, when we use it, we're referring to Elohim, Hashem, Adonai. Yeah. So it's a unipl it's actually uniplurality when it's used of when it's used of the God of the Bible. Because all of the verbs that go with it, all of the pronouns that go with it, are in the singular. And they have to match by Hebrew grammar. Okay. And yet it's in a plural form, so we call it a uniplurality. Same thing happens with Elohim, with the God when it's used with the God of the Bible, the God of Israel. So these are important under, things to understand, to know, to be part of this congregation that, you know, for us, if coming to Yeshua, it doesn't mean I made mental ascent. I read the book and, yeah, he's my Lord, but I'll live however I want. <laughs> you know what I mean? Because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't match. He's my Lord, but I, I'm not going to do that Tevila thing because I don't afraid of water, I don't want to, um, I'm not going to stop doing my, uh, yeah, I came to Yeshua, yeah, he's my Lord, but I beat my wife, so what? <laughs> What's the big deal? No. no, man, you have not, you have not changed, I'm sorry. You're not loving your neighbor as yourself, you're not loving your wife, good grief, right? That's, that's not having done teshuva. I still lie all the time. I still go and, and steal at the store all the time. I'm a kleptomaniac. I can't help myself. Uh, I still, right? People cling to things. Now look, there's the thing about sanctification. You're not coming in perfect. There's a difference between not being perfect and refusing to change. When God shows you things in your life and you refuse to change, then you might struggle with change and need help to change. Addictions, right? But are you refusing to even try to get the help? You see? Struggling to be righteous and holy is not a sin. That's a good move. That's a good thing. Refusing. us and our behavior and our lives and our thoughts really because it's all about the thinking battlefield of the mind our thought processes have to be holy and in line with scripture and i think that is really i mean when you look around i mean the majority of people don't struggle with addictions or in the body of messiah the majority of people struggle with thoughts and the thought processes that lead to behavior that then manifest themselves in different ways including addiction so learning that eyes are pretty open. <laughs> okay okay uh, let me see if I missed anything to apply for membership have emunah and the Messiah his atoning work on their behalf have done teshuva repented of sins acknowledge Yeshua as their master Lord as evidenced by life of obedience as he enables them uh, includes but no way limited so with things you commit to regular attendance tithing. how many people know tithing didn't originate in the Torah did you know that huh depends what you mean by the Torah when I say that there's God giving the Torah on Mount Sinai right with oh, Moses oh, but gracious. did tithing begin there no. No. Abraham Abraham the time. First mention of it, I think. First mention of it. That's right. He didn't. He didn't. <laughs> he didn't start tithing. And everybody was like, "What's that? What are you doing?" Yeah. They seemed to be familiar with it. It was not a strange 
The king didn't say, why are you giving me a tenth of his staff? I don't understand, right? <laughs> that was long before Moses. What about Yaakov? What about Jacob? Went to Esau. He's coming back now. He went away, reflect from Esau. He knows he's coming back later, right? He's coming back later, and he's scared. Actually, no, no, he's still on the way out. I remember something. He's on his way out, and he stops at this place called Beth El. And they built an altar there. Yeah, why did he build an altar there? No, this is on the way out. He had a vision when he was there. He was trying to sleep. He couldn't sleep, right? He has this vision. <laughs> and what's happening in the vision? There's a... It's kind of described, really, the Hebrew kind of describes it like a, like a stone staircase, almost. Like, so when you say, here, like, stairway to heaven, it's actually probably more correct. <laughs> so, and they're going up and down on there, the malachim, right? The, the angels are coming up and down. What did he see at the top and the bottom? top and the bottom, Elohim, right? And he makes a commitment there after this vision, and he, and he makes a, uh, this altar. If you'll bring me back safely to this land, I will give you a tenth. I will make you my God, and I will give you a tenth of all that I have. He knew the process. It wasn't making up a new thing. This is a thing people did. And if he came to the God of Israel, as he's making this statement, I'll do this. Still long before Moses. Well, we don't know if it's a tent, but we know they made offerings. And those offerings seem to be things that were from the, uh, the Torah as well. Because Torah, you know, there's a sense that Torah is timeless. It's just, had we lost it? Where we told things and we don't because it was destroyed in the flood and we don't know. But we see things. How did Noah know when Noah comes out after the flood and he lands on Ararat and he comes out, or even before he goes in, how many animals of each type does he choose? Two of every. Two of every. Seven pairs of clean. It's a little difficult. It's either seven of every clean or seven pairs of every clean, and one pair of unclean. What does he do when he comes out of the ark later? After the flood. He sacrifices one of every clean. So the, if it's seven instead of seven pairs, that means the one extra, the third wheel, the seventh wheel, that's the one going. So you're still left with pairs to reproduce. Could be. Um, but here's the question. How did he know what was clean and unclean? Who came first, Noah or Moses? What? Noah. Oh, because he's pre-flood. <laughs> You're losing me, Rabbi. So who came first, yeah. Noah? But Noah came way before Moses. But he knew what animals were clean and unclean. Told them I made this kind of animal, so see, I'm sure at some point it might not be recorded, but at some point he told them this is like you don't touch this, you don't mess with that. I don't like you know, this is not meant for consumption. <laughs> Probably storytelling throughout generations. I mean, they didn't have TV and cell phones and radio, and <laughs> you sat around the fire and eating about and those about those stories about your past mm -hmm. and your family. And well, we don't really know, do we? we? They could have written it down, and we just don't have those records anymore because everything was destroyed. I don't know. Can't say that was true. Can't say that they didn't either. And he was a friend of God and all that. But he knew what was clean and unclean. Not to just, just download the information to him directly, but he was a friend of God, though. He was a righteous man, so he could have had revelation too. Now, in the Brit Chadasha, let me ask you a question. In the Brit Chadasha, what does God write on our hearts? What does God write on our hearts? What does Yah, what does the, what does Yeshua, what is the Spirit writing on our hearts? What is the Ruach writing on our hearts? 
Torah. Okay, where do we now? We know Torah, we know that tithing was before Torah, already existing before it was written. To, if, if we're considering it as what was given to Moses, but where is uh, where is tithing described? Where does it tell us what it is and how to do it? Malachi. That's weird. Well, that tells us to do it. Melchi tells us to do it, but what is it? Where does it tell us what it is? Torah. A tenth of all your animals, a tenth of all your produce, a tenth of all, right? So if he's writing the Torah on your heart, what does that mean? Follow the parts you wanna. What is he giving you a passion for? Parts that you like. But <laughs> think about it. When Yeshua was confronted by some Purushim, some Pharisees, who had got their priorities mixed up, right? And they were not giving uh, uh, due consideration to the weightier matters of the law. What did he say about tithing? Basically said that they were so worried about tithing their little mints and still despite the fact that they were neglecting the weightier matters, but he never said not to tithe those offerings. He was saying you should do those, but in addition to that, you should pay attention to the weightier matters. Yeah. You're getting lost in the in the tithe. It wasn't talking about tithing in general being who cares or something, or it's not even the little, even the little tiny thing like, you know. It was that one day when somebody gave me a nickel. <laughs> I should tithe on that nickel. I don't even know how, because I'm going to get a tenth out of a nickel. I guess I'll give a whole penny, right? Uh, and she was saying, you get so worried about tithing on the nickel, John, but you were really mean to Lena the other day. <laughs> you know? Uh, He's not saying, John, don't tithe. He's saying the opposite. He's saying, yeah, tithe, that's good. And even and it's even noble. It's even a good thing that you're getting into. But you know what? What's more, way more important, you're getting, you're getting your priorities confused. You need to treat people right. If you miss a penny from that nickel, that's, that's little small potatoes. You better treat Lena right. So that's Brit Chadasha, right? Yeshua, last I checked, he's in Brit Chadasha. Um, yeah. What do we think will be the law of the world when, when Yeshua returns? Do you think he'll create a new law or he'll go with the old one? What do you think? Yeah, he never changes. So we could kind of, we could get used to it now. <laughs> Oh, we could, you know. But if we have a passion for it, that's part of it, right? Okay, active participation. What We talked about this before, right? Like his gifts. He gives us gifts. The Spirit gives everyone gifts. Everyone has different gifts. Why does he give us gifts? So we can be rich and go on TV and buy a big mansion? Uh, huh? So we can get things done that are better on his agenda. What kind of things? Uh, kingdom work, uh, so we can get um, the, uh, the scriptures taught so that we can support each other through tough times so that we could bring some world restoration, right? Yeah, yeah, so we can help each other, help restore the world. Lena is sick. Diana has a gift of healing, right? Zach's ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> That's Southern talk for ignorant. Kathy, she's a genius, right? We need to help each other. But on the other hand, Zach, boy, he's got a zeal for going out to help people. And Lena needs some help, right? She's not going to make it without some help. So Kathy helps Zach. 
Zach helps Lena. Lena helps Lourdes. Lourdes helps Diana. Diana helps you. All with different things. We all have different gifts. They're not meant for us to keep and hold in. We're supposed to stir up our gifts and use them to help other people. This ties back into the top one, regular attendance. I, I don't want to go today. I'm tired. God made a special appointment to meet with you on Shabbat, but all his people are supposed to be there. And when you go there, you're not the only one there. Everybody else is there. Now, if you don't, if you come because you can't, if you can't go, that's one thing. But if you can go, right, and, and nothing's holding you back, and you're just like, oh, I'm too tired. If you're sick, that's another thing too, right? If you're sick, I don't want to make everybody else, that's something. But if you just don't want to go, I'm feeling kind of tired today. I think I'll stay home. Well, you have the gift of healing, and there are people there who need healing that day. Or you have a gift of teaching. You know some things that no one else knows. You have a gift of discernment, and somebody comes in that day and starts to stir up trouble in the congregation, and you would be, if you were here, you would know there's, there's a demonic spirit in that person. I can sense it. There's something wrong, and you need to. You need, I'm going to tell the rabbi, something's wrong with that. We need to confront that. Something has to be done. If you're not here, maybe nothing does get done, but poison spreads from that person. I'm sorry. I don't need to be pointing at you when I'm saying this. But you, No, I can't point at my wife either. I have to pick a fictitious person. That, right? But the poison is being spread that day because you didn't come with your discernment. And you know, rabbis always tied up with Google. I gotta get this done. I gotta get that. I gotta get that. Then somebody comes immediately after, starts talking to me. Meanwhile, somebody's over in the corner, corner talking some kind of craziness that's totally anti-biblical, and it's spreading. Oh, I never thought of it that way. And they don't have good, solid biblical backing, but it sounds interesting. It sounds intriguing, and it starts to spread. You see. And the people that they talk to go home and they start to look on the internet and they see Joe Smith's, you know, I'm the genius website. <laughs> because, you know, who looked uh, and learned Hebrew all by themselves um, with no one to help them, supposedly. And they now know X, Y, and Z and no one else does. And they, believe, and they start to believe Joe Smith with his XYZ. And Joe Smith's XYZ is, is just spreading all over the internet. Yeah. And it's wrong. <laughs> it's wrong. Because no one stopped the person in the corner. Because the person who could have was tired that day. <laughs> Do you see what I'm saying? All right. Because when we need each other. The day that you might not need to come, you need to come because of somebody else. Because your gifts are meant for other people. There are days that you need to come for yourself. There are days when you are depressed or something and you need some, some pick-me-up. There are days when you just feel lost. There are days you need fellowship. There are days when you need healing. There are days when you need yada, 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 yada. And you know when you come here, there are people here who love you. And they want to help you. Okay, enough. Sorry. I could go keep going on other things. So. That's, that's the thing. Core beliefs. So another thing. Uh, due to Shuva, knowledge of Shuva, what the life looks like, uh, yada, yada, yada. Um, give an application. Diana has a for, has forms for applications. So if you wanted to join us, it's, there's nothing to, all this stuff is on there. So this is like in place of a class, you already know all this stuff on there from doing, from being here today, hopefully. If you don't, you know, ask a question that it's a chance like, I didn't want to raise my hand in front of everybody. Kind of embarrassing. So you could ask that. It gets clarification. Either from her or from me. Because she's she'll give me a form, you fill it out. She signs it, or Lena signs it, and then I'm the final signature. 
so you get a chance with, with leadership to ask any kind of questions you would have. Uh, I think it's the last thing you need to, uh, just FYI, um, Members who can vote must be 21 years of old, 21 years old. If they're 18 years old and independent of their parents and supporting the congregation, then they can vote. A child under 18 can be a member, but not a voting member. Um, what else? Last thing there is agree with the core beliefs or AKA a doctrinal statement. And this is it. It's kind of big compared to the other things we talked about, but not really. It's pretty small and it's, you know, it's core beliefs, not everything, right? The God of the Bible is real. Raise your hand if you have a problem as I, as I go through. The God of the Bible is real. He provides salvation through the atoning, redemptive work of Yeshua. The Bible provides his guidance for living. And the Holy Spirit enables true believers to follow that guidance. Moreover, he gives purpose to everyone, both individually and corporately. Both individually and corporately. His people are to remain faithful and share the good news with others. Those who come to follow Yah, the God of the Bible, enter the Brit Chadasha, the New Covenant. We believe that the terms of this covenant can be seen in Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8, and Hebrews 10. We go over that a lot, so I didn't specify it all. But you can check it out. Uh, the essence and structure of the body of Messiah are best illustrated in Romans 11. That's the grafting into the olive tree, along with natural branches. Uh, a powerful and accurate descriptive term for the body is the commonwealth of Israel, which is from Ephesians 2. And the central mission and purpose of that assembly can be found in Matthew 8, actually at the end of Matthew 8. 28. Say 8. 28. Okay. Does anybody have any... I mean, those are scriptures we talk about a lot, but does anybody have any questions about those scriptures? Matthew 28, what are we talking about? Some people call it Great Commission, right? They don't really present it too well, though, right? Because it's, uh, we're going to make Talmudim of the Goyim, teaching them to obey everything Yeshua taught us, immersing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. There are three definite articles in there. We have a mission. And what is the Brit Chadashah? You know what it is now, right? What's a covenant? It's an agreement, a serious agreement, yada, yada. If you don't have any questions, or maybe you can bring up your questions later if you have any. So that's the core beliefs. And it was nice to meet you. Thanks. And I'm going to wrap up here in a second. Anyway, and we'll do, uh, we have lots of kala and grape juice. So um, I don't think we have anything else for Oneg, though, right? Just grape juice and kala today? No? Okay, that's good, though. There's a lot of it. All right. I was going to do this. Raise your hand, Dana could give you a form. But let's keep it, uh, let's just make it so people could just, you know who Diana is. Raise your hand. So if you're interested and you want to fill out the form and join us, then just see Diana there. And we could go over. Shavuotov. And we could go over this part next week, the statement of faith. You don't need to, you notice, in our bylaws, we don't say you have to agree with all the things listed in our statement of faith. The things you have to agree with is what was already up above. That's already done. There are a lot of things uh, that leaves a lot open, right? But in a way, a lot of those things are covered as well. Little, little vague statements like biblical teaching, for example, you know, uh, kind of cover everything. But 
I think it's important. There are certain ideas out there that are not correct. But there's no statement by Yeshua, for example, that says, if people believe X, Y, Z, don't allow them to come into your midst or something. Coming into your midst is how they learn what's right and wrong. Right? Studying together. Uh, and we can all learn from each other, too. There are times when there may be things that, uh, that we all need to learn. And sometimes a visitor can be the one bringing it in. We have to be careful. Right, what we're allowing in, and if something's that that uh, amazing new thing, uh, we have to test it. We have to use discernment, uh, and we have to use the scriptures and the spirit to do that. But we're open to it. I can tell if you're interested. I can tell you some things I, that have changed in my life over the years in theology, um, and why. So, you know, I do, but I don't change my theology with the wind because someone comes in and something sounds cool or something. That's all right. So uh, in the future, and maybe next week, we'll talk about uh, our statement of faith in reg as regards the Holy Spirit, Elohim, man, resurrection and judgment, Israel, and Messianic Judaism. And I think that was the last slide. Uh, on there, so we'll save that for an, another week. If you're again, if you're interested in joining us, if you weren't here this week, if you were watching on on video though, if you watch this video, and then you got all you need, just come on in and ask Diana for the form, and you, and uh, and we'll hook you up. You can be a member. And I say that the reason we're doing that right now, the reason I'm putting that kind of stress is because next week after service is our annual meeting. And so if you wanted to be able to like participate as a voting member of the congregation, then you would need to join as, you know, be a actual member to be able to do that. And you could do that by getting a form and signing it beforehand. Everybody good? I think most of you in here are members, but some aren't. So, all right. Lourdes, will you close us in prayer? God, we're just so um, thankful and, and grateful for this week, Lord. Just so many ways that you show how you do provide and you take care of us. So we just uh, give you all the praise and glory right now, Lord. And I just lift up uh, all those who are here right now, Lord, as we listen to John's words, that they would just um, pierce our hearts, Lord, with your truth, and that we would just um, keep growing in your word and, and just trying to be the hands and feet that you need on this earth, Lord, that there would be such a revival in this country, Lord. Um, I know we're small, but we can still have a ripple effect, Lord. So thank you for those that you're bringing in. Um, we pray for those who have gone, who come and go, and, and that they would find you somewhere along the way, Lord. Uh, right now, I just ask for you to just listen to the petitions on everyone's heart here, Lord. There are so many needs represented um, for help, marriages, families, relationships, broken hearts, depression, anything, Lord, um, that's on people's hearts in, this, in the midst of us, Lord, I pray that you would just uh, speak to them in a way that only you know how to speak to us, Lord, and that it would be well received. We thank you for Torah that helps us, guides us, Lord, and um, that Jesus, you fulfilled in Torah. Um, so help us to just be obedient to the way that you want us to go. Um, bless everyone the rest of the week, Lord, as they go about a uh, busy week. And again, just uh, want to give you thanks and praise for all that you're doing, all that you've already done, and Lord, for what you will be doing. It's in Yeshua's name, I pray. Amen. Amen. You guys tired. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
And then if somebody could uh, grab the grape juice and the cups and we'll do uh, filling them. I don't know if bless you and keep you, guard you and protect you. I don't know make his face to shine on you, to shine on you and be gracious to you. Amen. 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 Amen.